Hello? Right. So, let's see who's up next. Anguilla, are you all set? Followed by Montserrat, Jamaica, Bahamas, Bermuda, St. Vincent, U.S. Virgin, Virgin Island, and that's it. Yes, I'm going to make sure that we finish on time so you're back here for 7 p.m.
Are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. So we will start. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. My presentation is on the development of football of primary schools in Angola. The objective of this development is to allow our youth players to play more football, provide the schools with opportunity to develop, to develop under the FIFA football program, school, um, football for schools, to host more U12 tournaments, to develop a U12 squad through our academy where we can harness some skills from, from our elite players and to get other sponsors to come on board to sponsor the tournament, which, which we will be offering them exclusive rights, naming rights. Background on primary school football. It has been in existence for the past 29 years. The boys' tournament has been running consecutively for 29 years, and the girls for 21 years. It is a sponsored sport and it is well attended. It's a sport where there's a lot of passion from both the youth and the adults, where the adults can sometimes get a little carried away, including myself. Um, the drawback the, prime, the school grounds that the children play on are not conducive for the players to play. They are exposed to injuries based on the unlevel fields. Our picture there pro will not fully show you what the fields look like. That is from one of the schools. They are quite rocky. It's as if rocks grow in Anguilla, so even if you clean them up, soon you'll see the place rocky again. Um, the other benefits, the properties are adjacent to the schools, to all six primary schools, and the properties are owned by the government. So therefore, that's where we will have the buy-in from the government. Um, project details. As I said, we'll be developing six grass fields on the six public primary schools. The cost of the project, 1,542,320, where 1,492,320 will go towards the development of the fields, and 50,000 will go towards maintenance for one year. A plus to that is the association just invested in some tractors, which will help to minimize that maintenance cost and the cost of spreading soil and the seedlings on the field. The size of the fields will be 73 by 50 meters. We are in discussion with the government to execute 20-year lease agreements between the government and the FA. Um, we are also in the process of drafting a, an agreement of understanding which will be signed by the government and the FA. It will include some clauses, some key clauses. The government uh, to cover all electrical energy for the duration or uh, the useful life of the fields. The FA will maintain the fields for the useful life. And we will be also asking for the option for renewal after the 20 years. Additional benefits to the association. The clubs will have the use of the field after school hours, like two clubs for field, and more youth tournaments can be held throughout the year. Why should this proposal be supported? The improved fields will encourage new interests from young players, parents, the government, and education, educators, and as I said, it will be a catalyst for the buy-in for schools for the FIFA football program. More football will promote physical and mental health. 
the use of the fields will help to develop life skills for all our youth, positive values among them, contribute to social cohesiveness and peace building. Our young players will be able to play in an environment that is safe and free from harm. That's in terms of better smooth fields. Um, we have the support of the government. The children will be able to play more football and it will, it will be an opportunity for FIFA football program to be encouraged. Prior to coming up with this project, a SWAT and a PES was done. These are summaries of the information that was presented. Um, and of course, I took out more of the positives than the, because the positives did away the negatives, so I summarized what um, the, the factors that we feel were necessary to go forward with this project. In terms of In terms of the strengths, it's a game that's been in existence for a long time. So it's proven that football, primary school football, will work in Anguilla. Uh, the opportunity that will come out of the fields will be more, more fields, more football. Um, presently, well, presently, we have insufficient fields as that's the real basis for us asking for this proposal to be considered. And if we provide a catalyst for children to play more football, it will reduce the efforts of the competition. Right now, children lean towards track and field because there are opportunities there that they can see there are persons, uh, icons who can see have benefited from track and field. If we can promote football, we can produce icons in football too that will encourage children more towards football. The external environment also proves favorable. We have the support of the government. We have availability to technology that can support promotion of the game. We, it will create social cohesiveness. It will bring more communities together, so that will cover our social aspect. And lastly, economical, we will have the support of FIFA funding, which I am very confident they will approve once we su support this, uh, submit this project. Um, from governance and forward requirements, in light of the fact that the, the amount is over 300,000, we have to meet the Article 7.4 regular. Um, the 7.4, what they call requirements. We have to submit a um, proof of a tender process and a bidding process. In my original project, I prepared a bid document to support the project. Proof of communication and approval by escrow and Congress that can be supplied through via the minutes. Proof that the proposal is in line with the development objectives defined and agreed in the contract of agreed objectives that can be supplied by a signed copy. We will also have to provide a cost estimate and contracts for the contractors. Tools that will have to be in place to ensure that all checks and balances are followed. We will have a work breakdown structure scope of work, issue log, project checklist, project charter. Um, these tools will be recommended to be used by the project manager and will be used as tools for the association and the development committee to monitor the project. Here is a sample of the work breakdown structure. Um, it grouped together areas which we will need to cover so that we can monitor the project more like in a group stage. We have the signing of the agreement of understanding, that's between the government and the FA. 
there would be the tender document or the tender process, which will have to take place before we forward a proposal to FIFA. Thereafter, we, once approved, we will be expecting FIFA funding and the signing of contracts by the contractors. In the second phase, uh, if you are following the WBS, always go from that end to that end. Um, we will have mobilization of equipment, evacuation, excavation of land, and removal of fill. The third phase, the installation of electrical works, pipes. We'll have irrigation systems, filling up the land, and constructing of a perimeter footing. And on the last phase, we'll have for the laying of the seedlings, the installation of the perimeter fence and the installation of the lights. From the HR aspect, the there will have to be a development committee that will include engineers, project managers, and field football field consultants. Um, independently, there will be project managers to manage the project and contractors. Physical resources will include well, equipment for excavation and so forth. That will be on the contractor's part. And then the FA's tractors will be used for spreading of soil and seedlings. From a financial perspective, we will provide the funding in accordance or in compliance with the contract. A finance team will be put in place to monitor and approve the use of funds prior to disbursement. From a branding standpoint, we will have ceremonies at all fields across the island where plaques, partnership plaques will be unveiled with FIFA, the government, and the FA. And we will use that opportunity coupled with social media to create awareness of the benefits of football and are to ignite further interest in football, namely promoting national players, local and national coaches, FIFA referees, job administrators. In summary, the requirement will be, input will be the lease land from the government, FIFA funding. The activity that will lead to the project will be development of the six football fields. The output will be the new fields for the youth to play on. The expected outcome, improved accessibility to football facilities, and the legacy will be a gateway to elite players, increased football participation, and improved player experiences. That's the end of the talk. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, it was very clear. Um, beginning to end, with a nice ending there. I like the end, like the deliverables, like the last one. And again, just every time you, you see or experience a, a presentation, everybody has very strong parts, some parts you have to work on. Please pick out all the good parts and, and you can utilize them. That's how we learn and that's why we sit down here and, and listen to each other speak because we all have some valuable bits of information to share with each other. Which one of the MEs objective does this apply to? It, it falls on the infrastructure. Infrastructure? Yes. And what was the timeline? Um, it's broken down in the WBS, where we have the first phase has a three month timeline, the second phase, two weeks, the third phase, two months and the final phase of month. Okay, thank you very much. So we will now <laughs> welcome Monstrat.
afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sandy Williams, and I'll be presenting on infrastructure development for playing services for the Montserrat Football Association. But before I get into it, who are we? Who is the Montserrat Football Association, and what do we stand for? So a little background. We have been affiliated with FIFA since 1996. And since becoming associated with FIFA, we've been, been, we've been the vanguard for positively promoting the vision of FIFA by ensuring that football is played under the best conditions and is accessible to persons in the most remote and poorest village anywhere, and in Montserrat's case, one of the smallest islands. Um, most of you may be aware that Montserrat is a volcanic island. We still have an active volcano. However, as a people, we are resilient and we continue to make strides. And this is a strategic path that we've been following in growing and developing football throughout the island. We have national teams that have been built from among Monstrations who live both locally and overseas because due to the volcan volcanic crisis, persons would have had to migrate to other countries, especially the UK. We now have a first class ground, which has been FIFA funded, and we are a major contributor to the sports tourism on Ireland. We have a deep passion and a great passion for football, and it's not only within the Monster Football Association, but Monstrations on a hold. Our mission statement, we shall be the premier facilitators and providers of football, to Monstrations of all sexes and ages, both in Monstrat and other major Monstration communities overseas. And our mission statement encompasses our vision that we would always include our diaspora because we have a large population living outside of the island, which has been devastated. So football development, infrastructure development, and playing services. Now, why have we decided to embark on such a project? So in order to do that, we had to look at our situation. What is our current situation there? So we have assets in our fields already. So the Montserrat Football Association currently owns all of the football facilities on island, which includes our main football um, complex at Blaze, and this is pictured here. And we also have two mini fields which are located in our communities and we have chosen Lookout and Salem because those are the heavily populated communities on island. And so persons can come out and play and utilize the fields as they so desire. And here we have the Lookout and actively engaging some um, football at the Salem field. What is the demand for football? Football is continuing to grow in and around the island. And so our fields are always fully populated and sometimes it has become insufficient um, because we have all of these youngsters coming out to play and we have programs running from Monday straight through to Saturday. And football is also becoming the number one sport on island. So the interest is being generated throughout from our grassroots level and going straight up to our teenagers and our elite and men. We recently started our women's program, well, restarted our women's program, and we've seen an influx of women coming out as well. And I've, all, I've tried my best to picture some of the programs where we had to share the field space, because some days we have more than one program running, and we have one grass pitch. So you can see that we've tried to divide the space. So most times, even when we have a women program, they're in one um, area of the field, and we try to work with what we have currently. Here again, we see that we have a growing grassroots. Our grassroots, they're always excited to come out and play. Sometimes we have um, hundreds of children just there. Maintenance. Due to the constant football traffic on the sole grass field, as was pictured before, and with the, the competitions that we've been engaging in, especially at the international levels, We've been forced, unfortunately, to close our fields to ensure that the, the complex is up to standards to host these matches. So currently, we're having our CONCACAF Nations League, and we have some home matches. And we've had to disappoint some of our, gra our grassroots and even our elite players because we've had to close off and, and try to you know, get it in here 
right below here we have our yard maintenance guy. It's not too clear on the screen, but we've been watering and we've been trying to get it back on, back on track. And so we have a lot of disappointed children right now. But our feedback, we've always been having positive feedback from FIFA officials, national teams, and other football enthusiasts who have been enjoying what the MFA has to offer. I'm not sure how many of you have been around, but we boast to have one of the best facilities around the island. And this is because we invest a lot into our maintenance and so forth. We went further and did a SWOT analysis. And this is important because before you embark on any project, you need to ensure that you understand your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats, just to avoid making any poor business decisions. So our SWOT analysis, um, the strengths, we have a very strong diaspora connection. Currently, um, based on statistics, we have approximately over 65,000 monstrations who are currently living abroad. We are also the number one organized sport on Ireland. Whilst cricket is a popular one, football boasts to be the most organized one because we, we ensure that from an administra administrative standpoint that we, get, we have everything in order. Our location at the Blake site is above sea level and base, and we understand that that is very good for players when they're playing on the field. Our association, of course, with FIFA, CONCACAF, and CFU, not only for the funding, but just being associated with such, a prestigious, such prestigious bodies, it gives us a little bit more as it relates to networking and so forth. And our facilities, we've had persons say, and quote, it looks and smells like football. Anytime you come up to Blake's, you see football. You know that it's a football field. Our weakness. We have limited field space, and as I mentioned before, we've had to close our programs. Access is a huge problem for the island of Montserrat. Um, we currently have two main um, ways that you can enter the island, which is either by air or sea. Our air access, um, we can only carry, we can carry up to a 19-seater. However, regularly we have a seven-seater which comes to the island, and that runs about three times per day. So if it is that we want to bring in teams and so forth, that's something that we have to think about. Our ferry as well, it runs um, five days a week. However, obviously, if you want to come in, you have to plan around the schedule. Human resource, because of our population size on island, sometimes we have to try our best to outsource and bring persons in, which can be an expense on our part. Opportunities, sports tourism is increasing, income generation, expansion of our current location, and partnering with our neighboring Leeward Islands um, community, perhaps creating a union, we never know. Our threat, migration. Um, we found that a lot of our young persons, we invest a lot into our grassroots, but after they reach a particular age, um, teenage age, and they're finished with secondary school, we find that a lot of them migrate for better opportunities education-wise, and we applaud them for that, but that is also a threat for us because our um, players are leaving us. And also an active volcano. Everyone, from the time you hear Montserrat, you think volcano, and that has been a threat because sometimes you might find that persons may not want to come. But how do we combat this? From the migration um, standpoint, we always ensure that we keep a good connection with our players, no matter where they are. Let them know that they're monstrations and that we appreciate them. So we always keep close contact. We have um, a technical director as well who goes around in the UK and you know checks on their progresses, both in football and their education and professional um, endeavors. The active volcano, how we've been trying to combat this is through our communication, ensuring that persons know that Montserrat is still alive and we're still well and we're still open for business. And currently our government has, and tourism authorities, they have a strategy. And so coupled with that, we see that this can be combated. So, football development. So, as I said to you earlier, what we want to do is to have some playing services. And here we have our complex. Our strategic objective here is to improve the quality and standard of football at all levels for men and women, boys and girls, through increased training as well as competitions. And this is why 
we have chosen this particular project. And as the video goes a little closer, this is the plot of land that we, are, we have identified and earmarked, and we are hoping to acquire. It's not ours as yet, but we are actually looking to, we are in discussions with the landowner. And as you can see, it is in close proximity to our current facility and another project that we have with FIFA that is ongoing, our dormitory project, which is happening right on the corner there. So what we will need? Our work breakdown structure, we are looking at the major um, ingredients, land, funding, building, and infrastructure. So from the funding standpoint, we're hoping to use our FIFA project funding to fund it completely. We're looking at the cycle 2090 to 20, 2022. We know that there will be an application process, so we'll ensure that we have everything that meets the requirements to submit that application. And some of the things that we're looking at is having a clear business plan prepared and ensure that it's submitted in a timely manner. We know that it takes time for funds to be released, so in order to hinder what we need, we need to ensure that we have things in place, right? And we need to ensure that we have all of our pro proper estimates. The land, as I said to you, the land is not ours, so we need to ensure that the land that we are earmarking is the correct size. We need to ensure that we are able to, if once we are able to purchase it, ensure that we have our title deeds and we are legal owners of the property and we ensure that we go to all of the local authority and whatever is required from Monsort standpoint. We need to identify and negotiate with the landowner. Currently, it's in a prime area and it's going for like about $27 per square foot. We're trying our best to negotiate to cut that in half. And we have to think about the clearing, the excavation, and the type of field that we want. But as I mentioned before, it will be a grass field. The building and infrastructure, we need to get a plan from our architect Approval by the local authority, once again, as it relates to building codes, you know that we are in a hurricane-prone environment, ensure that whatever we are building right now can sustain any sort of disasters, because right now we have the information, we have the knowledge, and so we need to ensure that we do pre put preventative measures in place. Also, we have um, sea blast issues, so we need to ensure that the materials that we utilize there um, can... Um, prevent that. Access to and from the site as well as ensuring that whatever we build um, we take into consideration. Toilet facilities, lighting and the team locker rooms. The financial analysis, what would we need? We know that we need to find the, the um, cost for the land, we need to think about excavation, the field layout, the changing rooms, seating facilities and toilets and these are the main areas that we need to look into. And yes, yeah, so we have the estimated um, expenditure that we have, what we would need to think about, what's the cost per square foot, the removal of trees, have we done an environmental assessment, the type of lights, is it, would it be energy efficient for future maintenance? And post-construction, we know that we would have to maintain it, field maintenance, utilities, the human resource, technical staff, facility managers, administrative staff, equipment purchase, which is very important for football to develop. So cost versus benefits, as I'm wrapping up, it is expected that we will be funded by fee for project funds, but we have to ask ourselves, how do you maintain two fields? Are there adequate human resource and financial resources available? And is it worth the investment? But we've done the cost versus benefits, and we realize that the benefits really do outweigh the cost. Right? So it's a definite yes for us. So what are the benefits? We have more football being played, development of the sport all year round, so we no longer have to close off when we are hosting international matches. We can have increased competitions because we can now invite other um, um, teams and clubs to come in and play, and they can have their own training facilities and training fields as well. We have job creation, pre and post development. We have increased interest in football because sometimes it can be a turn off. If you're not playing on the full field and you're only coming to be at the side, you may say like, this is not really football. But if you have the field and you have the, um, the grounds available, persons can feel that they're actually doing it. So yes, the benefits to derive is that we will achieve our strategic objective, which is to improve the quality 
and standard of football at all levels for men and women, boys and girls, through increased training as well as competitions. So the successful implementation of this project will indeed position the MFA to continue our quest in being pivotal in fostering the growth and development of football in Montserrat, as we will better be able to manage and develop the affairs of the association and enhance the playing conditions for our players. And that brings me to the end of our present, from my presentation. Any questions? Well done. Very <laughs> You're an expert. You look very comfortable. <laughs> And the information was, was on Thank point, you. clear, um, very nice. Um, um, based on the claps, I feel, um, yes, we endorse. Any questions? So sh you'll, you'll hire her to present for you guys? Yes, I agree with you. <laughs> hey, go ahead. The, the, the population living on island is just over 5,000 persons, but as I said before, we have a huge diaspora, 65,000. No, 65,000. Living outside. Huh? Oh, okay. Our population pre-volcano was about $14,000, but we need... Uh, 14,000, sorry, not dollars, sorry, people. About 14,000, and I think at one point we reached as far as 19. How, uh, yeah, however, however, since the volcanic crisis, we know that persons are procreating a little bit more. <laughs> right? And so, no, but really and truthfully, when we speak about monstrations living abroad, and in a football sense of it, it speaks about lineage. Right? And so because persons would have left the country now, you have that association and that connect with Montserrat. Pre no, no, no. We, we have some that would have migrated pre-volcano. However, majority of persons would have left the island um, post-volcano. No, 65,000, and that is from statistical data, yeah? Um, what they, what they, you see what's happening, right? We are actually in the process of creating an identity for Montserrat because we've been um, ravaged by the volcano. We're actually at this point in time trying to see how best we can reconnect with persons who would have left, um, the, left the island, and so that's what we're doing. So I think persons have actually been um, engaged to do that. Outside, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, but it's the truth for other countries. It, it happens. That's what happens with migration. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, we're putting a football field, and I wish that I had. You see where the Blake's complex is? It was quite similar to that, but we have persons who have the vision. Right? They, they saw the vision before because I remember um, our president, Mr. Castle, he was the one who was president back then. And he was giving me a story that before, when he wanted to put the Blake's football complex up there, people thought that he was crazy. And now it's world class. So it is possible. I have a question, actually. Uh, sure. First of all, thanks. I, I was impressed by the Thank presentation. Uh, I built on the discussion we just had about the population and the, 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 the way you, you reach out to your diaspora. Is that, the question is that, uh, do you have a communication plan? Because you pointed out all the benefits of mm -hmm. this project and mm -hmm. that uh, they are there and, uh, I mean, uh, they are tangible. Um, but a lot of what you explained uh, is actually based on communication. So I just wanted to know a little bit more about that side of the project. Okay, so our communication plan, we do have one, but just last month we've actually engaged a team to relook look at our communication plan because they found that it was limited in some aspects. So we now have persons from the diaspora as well who are using their knowledge and their expertise in that field to assist us in that. But currently, what we've done, we've had persons who are stationed in the UK as well, as well as 
um, station in Montserrat who are working together to ensure that the word gets out. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, you all look so like like you want to do a stretch. Let us do a stretch. One, two, three, four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a spirit. Yeah, that's a spirit. All right. So my name is Ian Kemba, and and with me is the great one, Sir Dalton. Why not coming up, Dalton? What is happening here? What is happening? Some sabotage here. Come on. Hmm? You know, slide show. Oh. Oh. Oliver, you're not doing nothing. Good. Thank you, sir. So, it will be a two part presentation. Um, sir Dalton, he said that I'm the shy one, so he's the one who likes to chat. So, I will make him go first. Step across. Good afternoon, everyone. I must say that the panel, you really look splendid. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Our scope to construct a fully operational technical center, and this will be at the UWI Mona Bowl um, in Kingston. All right? This will include a technical building consisting of two changing rooms for teams referee rooms, administrative room, and meeting room to conduct workshops and seminars. Dormitory will be a two-story building with 28 rooms to accommodate at least 52 persons with a fully operational kitchen. And you know, we love our stomach, eh? So we got to have a kitchen there. Um, to provide meals for the, the teams and whoever occupy the building. We'll have stove, refrigerator, ice maker, other small appliances, additional tele additionally television sets, computer system, internet cable service will be provided for recreational and entertainment purposes. A turf, we'll definitely have a turf. Artificial turf will be of a FIFA-approved standard, which will be provided for the players with, with the opportunity to increase their skills. We'll have the construction of the technical center, which will be established out of a need to reduce the high operational cost to include rentals for housing, transportation, training, and matches. Having this multi-purpose facility will significantly reduce costs. The challenges. The JFF spends thousands of dollars, and in our currency, it's millions of dollars over each year for rentals, housing, meals, transportation, training field, and matches. Project planning. The technical center will be constructed on a phase basis over a 19-month period. The technical building, approximately six months, the dormitory, nine months, and the artificial turf, four months. Cost, cost estimate. A cost estimate is approximation of a cost 
of a program, project, or operation. This cost estimate is the product of the cost estimating process. There are three types of cost estimate, magnitude, budget, and definitive. The budget, material cost for the technical building, dormitory, and artificial turf, labor cost for the facility, equipment purchase, etc. Financing. Funds for the project will be obtained from the FIFA 2.0, the forward 2.0. Since the funds is approximately 2 million US dollars, the project will be put to tender. Governance. Approval will be sought from the respective governmental and non-governmental agency very important approval of the JFF executive and to inform the Congress. The risk. A risk assessment will be done on the center to identify fire hazard for people at risk, evaluate recording of the findings, preparing an emergency plan and providing training and review and update regularly. breakdown for the risk. The assessor will reference a question template when completing this assignment. All right, so this will include the details of the building, fire protection, the fire hazard, people at risk, risk rating, significant findings, and also photograph and supporting evidences. Time is not on our side, so we're moving full speed ahead. Um, marketing, marketing of the facility, sports marketing focus on the promotion of sports event and team, and as a result of that, the resident building will be available for renting of teams during the off season. Field will be available for renting to the football family for matches and tournaments, and the meeting rooms will be used for hosting seminars and workshops. We know that digital marketing now is the norm. So the facility will be marketed using digital activity, mainly on the internet, mobile phone, display advertising, etc. Sponsorship. You want to touch on that? Yes. Sponsorship is something that is really needed and very important to our operation. So sponsor, sponsoring something is the act of supporting an event activity, person, or organizational financially are through the provision of products or services. The individual or group that provides the support similarly to a benefactor is known as a sponsor. Sponsors will be allowed branding opportunity, etc. Brand visibility, display of permit awards, feather banners, etc. All right, so we turn now to corporate communication. We know that communication is key, all right, in cultivating and maintaining a corporate image. And, you know, so a solid corporate communication teams provide initiative to most company image, communicate with internal and external audi audiences, and sustain long-term positive rep reputation. Effective communication will be required in our part when we are marketing the facility, the whole matter of event planning and the use of the facility. Additionally, the member association will have an effective communication strategy outlining its goals, activities, audience, and message. As it relates to event planning, yeah, um, we see what it includes the whole matter of budgeting, establishing timelines, developing a team, arranging for activities, et cetera, et cetera. The facilities will be used for at least, well, to, 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 to host at least three local and three international tournaments per year. Hosting of referees and coaching education program, grassroots programs to include workshop and festi festival, Games and training session involving clubs and institutions. 
Then we go to maintenance and regulation. For the dormitory, the residence will be cleaned and maintained by the staff on a regular basis. Routine maintenance by staff will be conducted daily while there will be weekly cleaning of the furniture and floors. Rules governing the usage has been developed and placed in a strategic area on the building or in the building. A dormitory maintenance form will be created. Technical building rules governing the use has been developed and will be placed in a strategic area or in strategic areas on the, on the building. A maintenance schedule is also developed this will be given to the responsible staff. Okay, so as it relates to maintenance and regulation of our, our turf, we have looked pretty much um, at, at nine, nine, nine points, nine things that we need to do in order for us to keep it in tip-top condition. Um, first and foremost, we need to have the right equipment, um, taken care after it is installed, we need to keep the turf clean, um, tend to the turf as needed, brush regularly, uh, rinse frequently, eliminate stench, emulate weed, etc., etc. Conclusion. We're doing it in record time, right? <laughs> Installing the artificial grass can be very expensive. Nevertheless, we know that it is an investment and it will help us to save time and money in the long run. We are confident that with this construction of the center, the, it will significantly reduce the high costs which we had to, to encounter as it relates to rental, housing, transportation, and matches. Um, it would also provide a comfortable environment for all the stakeholders, players, sponsors, etc. Sponsors with benefits in that their brand will be exposed. Indeed, we can say that having the center will be something huge. That should have been and, the end. And so we take questions if there is any. So run away. Yeah. Yeah, consultant. Any questions? I know you um you briefly state why um, the artificial surface. What do you say what could you identify some risks in installing an artificial surface, or have you considered any risks? One of the risks that um, you can have is the damage of the, the surface by idle persons, because it's, it's, it's a fire hazard. It can be a fire hazard. So that's one of the risks. So you can use it. In second, you can lose the whole plane surface. How would you handle it? Well, we have it in a fenced and secured area, so hopefully, and there are rules that governs the, the use of the facility, so you're not allowed to bring any flammable things on the plane surface or anything close to. Is this going to be in the same location as your the most recent field that you opened? Is this, Is this the same location as the most recent field that you opened? Yes, yes. So why they are not somewhere else then? So you're going to build a second field, you mean? Well, this is... Or this is the field that you already Yes, it's built. proposing, it's in the past, we bring into the future. You're confusing me. So this project the, is for something project, that's already done? This project has, well, has already been done. Our technical center has been done. It has been completed? Yes, it has been completed. Yes. from the past into the All right, so what are some of the and challenges this, this that you have right now running this facility? Well, in our strategic plan, I should have said it at the start, right. in which we have the proposal to have at least three more of this facility okay. in other areas. We have four zones. So we have one in zone one already and three other zones that we want to replicate this sort of template in the other zone. So it's a past, but it can go straight into Okay, so what are some of the challenges or what have you learned from this project moving forward? 
one of the challenges is the, the demand on a surface like this. There's huge demand, and so we have to set up a template, a schedule in which we allow the general public to have access to the facility. So scheduling is a challenge. Yes, yes, we're learning from that. Any question? Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, most so right. we will have Bahamas next. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Just a little background. My name is Carl Lynch, Deputy General Secretary of the Bahamas Football Association. Um, just some background on me. In 1996, I was appointed by the current administration to head the youth development program for the Bahamas. And so, what's that, 24 years later, I'm still here trying to help develop um, our programs. So, this initiative is called the Bahamas Primary Schools Futsal Project, uh, the Reset 2020. And the reason for this is that currently we find ourselves in a situation where as we enter more and more international competitions, we realize um, while we're making some high headway, headway, after 24 years, we should be further along than we are. Um, this project will ensure that the Bahamas Football Association's strategic objective of to increase access to football activities in family islands with a population of over 4,000 persons by 2022 are realized. So the project is scheduled to begin March 2020 after the approval processes have taken place, um, after we have gotten the approval um, through the um, Congress, which will be held in November. We've already gotten approval from the Executive Committee, and we will be ready to move forward with the project. Okay, so. The aim is to create and develop a training program aimed at targeting young primary school age children with the view of creating a larger pool of skilled and passionate players and have them playing at an early age. It will encompass skills development, improve vision and comfort on the ball while growing attacking capabilities, faster thinking, pinpoint passing, quicker reflexes and widely improve touch and technique. What happened? The um, pointer. Yeah. All right. Okay, so the question is with all that being said, why the futsal project? Okay, so currently we have players who are underdevelop early age players, players entering the sport at an older age with no skills, a lot of excitement, a lot of, um, a lot of, what's the word I'm searching for? 
uh, athletic abilities. Most teachers in the primary schools have no soccer background to instruct kids. Most of them are mainly um, track and field, basketball, volleyball, softball educators. Um, there's no um, established curriculum in, this, in the primary schools. Lack of grass facilities for training. Um, and this is where we're at currently. Okay, so just some statistics for you. The Bahamas is a country of roughly 395,000 uh, people, and we are an um, island of nations, all right, over um, 20 of those inhabited, with the majority of the residents being on New Providence. You're looking at 78%. Um, that has changed considerably since the passing of the hurricane, and thus these figures would change. All right, in the public schools, soccer is allocated four weeks uh, for a, basically a two-week tournament for boys and a two-week tournament for girls. And this is done in October. So right now we're gearing up for, for that event. In the public, sorry, in the private primary schools, there's no set um, curriculum for soccer. So they play for a period of two, three weeks, and then that's it. And when they say play, I'm talking about in in the school environment, not outside um, competitions. Okay, so the percentage of primary school students on New Providence, um, as you can see, 91%, sorry, 2% actually play um, public school primary, and private primary 16,000 16, approximately. Uh, just a breakdown of, this is New Providence only. Uh, this is the major, major um, populated island in the Bahamas. And basically the primary schools project would encompass four areas. The island is broken down into four areas. Regions where we set up, uh, we've selected 40 schools. You have 10 schools in the four regions. gone ahead and broken down those schools. And these are the schools that we've already begun groundwork in talking to the, the, um, the facilitators, some of the PE school teachers, some of the principals, who are all excited about the ability of having kids um, enroll in a program where they can play. And just so you know, this, is, this program is geared towards um, second and third graders. So we're talking six and seven year olds. Okay, so part of the initiative is futsal. We don't have that many indoor facilities. So we're looking at converting outdoor facilities. Um, if you travel in the Bahamas, you realize that every school, every community has a basketball court. Um, so yeah, we're a basketball um, loving nation. And so the idea would be to create a um, unified court or shared court environment for basketball as well as futsal. So basically, we identify, we identify the, the courts in the schools and in the community, resurface and stripe them um, based on the measurements, standard measurements, and use for schools and community programs. Um, initially, for this project, which is for one year, uh, we're talking about three courts in each region that we will go ahead and resurface and mark out. Uh, most have a good surface, but others need striping. And we have buy-in from the government and uh, community leaders to make sure that this happens. Now, how does, how does the program work? The program works whereby we have a program director. Um, we also hire 12 coaches, three for each region. And the idea is to go out into these schools on a weekly basis, two, um, a total of six hours per week at the schools, after school, where they coach and develop these kids in the art of futsal. In addition, in addition to that, they also work with the teachers who are involved in the program. Okay, so basically this is how uh, the agreement, the agreement meetings with stakeholders, hire program director, curriculum develop, 
um, hire the coaching assistants, school assignments, training and evaluations, um, and we are underway. And again, why futsal? It's an exciting, small-sided, enjoyable format which allows the BFA to reach into every part of the Bayman community. Um, it's the great equalizer as all schools have a basketball court on their premises and not all have grass fields. It is proven to build technical and tactical and more skilled players, a format to get persons into football for the first time and also retain them if they um, have left. And why take my word for it? We ask the experts and we have their replies. All right, so I'll just let you read through that. Say again? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay, so how the plan works, so I went over it earlier. You get 40 uh, public and private school grade two and three year olds who will be immersed in six hours of futsal training by qualified instructors. Um, over 500 children after this first, okay, after this first um, this segment, this pilot program has started, over 500 um, children will attain soccer fundamentals, which will carry them on for their years ahead. Teachers will be ex exposed to another format of soccer, which would allow them to get in the game as they don't have to worry about finding a grass pitch. We'll have jamborees held regularly um, in the Bahamas. Private and public schools tend not to play direct competition unless it's in a national uh, program. It used to be in the 80s, but then there was a strike, yada, yada, there was a separation, and they have never gone back together. So this will give us an opportunity to bridge, to bridge that gap. Over 50 coaches will now be able to spread the joy of futsal. Clubs and school programs will be the direct beneficiaries. Course. This is the breakdown based on the schedule and the negotiated amounts. We also have our budget for equipment. Outcomes 40 primary schools impacted, over 578 year olds introduced. Uh, to the game and happily playing pilot program leads the second year where we hope enroll, enrollment increases by 20%, playing fields level, increased number of coaches specializing in futsal, increasing the number of referees for futsal permanent place on the school's curriculum. Okay, time to change the business model and we need your help and wait a minute. Go back a slide. a video but it's not coming up. Stop clicking. No, no, I'm leaving no. show you do. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. Do you have the video somewhere? Okay. Yes, yes on my laptop. All right. And that's the end. Thank you very much. Okay, how far back you want me to go, Stacey? That's the first slide. Huh? Oh.
anybody else have any questions in the audience? Any questions? No. Okay, so I was wondering, how are you actually going to implement it? I understand that the overall project, what you aim to do, like where is the power for the training of the coaches and all of that kind of thing? Actually, that is in the paper. Okay. That I, yeah, I was, I was trying to explain that to Anjani earlier that I thought both were going to be and this is just a summary, but yeah, it's in the yeah. it's in the actual paper so itself. You have all of that yeah. Oh, okay. um, all I, the time, the timelines, etc., is in the. Um, I have a question which has been already asked to to other participants. Um, what are the main risks of this project? The main um, reason for the project is that. Uh, no, the main risks. Oh, risks. risks yeah. Oh, the main risk is we have less and less players, um, skilled players, um, moving through the program as they get older, um, which does not bode well for our national, our national programs. We see it in we see it in the under 13s as they come through. Um, the majority of kids in our programs come through at the age eight, nine, ten, and in the case of girls, they come in 12, 13, 14 relate in the program. They're very, they're very interested, energetic, um, like I said, athletic, but they don't have their requisite skills. And so it's a, frustration, a frustrating proposition for not only the coaches, but for the players and parents as well. So the whole idea is to get them playing early. As they move through, you would hopefully see uh, improvement in the level of players um, as they move through the, the programs. Thank you. OK, um, I saw you mention that Bahamas is very big on basketball. Yes. So do you anticipate any challenges sharing the basketball field? I know that you mentioned that you have a relationship, but as far as scheduling. And this is the reason why um, courts on schools is the way to go, because you have the buy-in from the teachers. And so we're able to then factor in the use of the, use of the courts. Um, and in a lot of instances, you have the, the basketball coaches who prefer to try and move their kids indoors. So that's fine. Let them go indoors. We'll just play on the courts outdoors. But it's, it's, a, shared, it's, a, it's, uh, it's a shared arrangement. OK, then. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we can take a break, or we, can, we have three more presentations. Would you like to go through three more presentations, or we could leave earlier? Yes, three more. What do you all think? Go with the three. So, okay. So, we <laughs> so if, if you want to have some coffee, you can have it. Um, so we will have Bermuda next. Then we will follow by St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And last but not least, U.S. Virgin Island. And that's it. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I want to acknowledge that, that, that I'm starting early, so does that mean I have extra time? Okay. That's not going to go against my time, is it?
Okay. All right, I'm on. Good afternoon again. Um, I like to start my presentations with a quote. Um, and here it goes. Some people think football is a matter of life and death. But I can assure you it's more serious than that. <laughs> the next one is the future of football is feminine. And then to bring it local to Bermuda, our national teams like to say, see it and achieve it. Just some background, first on myself, I got involved in women's football actually by a mistake. Not a mistake, a friend of mine, or who I thought was a friend, invited me to a training session. He was the coach, and I'm still waiting for him to come. He never turned up. And that was like 20 something years ago. So I've been involved in women's football for that long. I don't know whether to thank him or go and look for him and sort him out. <laughs> OK, so Bermuda's women's football, internationally, we do fine. Our, our women's senior women's team just finished recently playing in the final round of the competition, sorry, the CONCACAF women's competition. Our under 20 women have made it to Sorry, I had placed second in the previous two tournaments um, in the group stage. Our under 17 women, they made it to the final round of CONCACAF um, qualification. Our under 15 girls, who I might put in a commercial, I was a coach, won the uh, CONCACAF Division II championships last year, all without a senior women's league. Just imagine if we had a women's league. So just a little introduction. i to put this back so I can see. As stated in our previous strategic plan, as it relates to women's football, we will grow the number, our numbers by 50%. To start the women's league, we'll, oh, sorry, the start of the women's league will play a major role in ensuring that not only we meet that we surpass that goal in our plan. The Women's Committee will ensure that it's a safe, fun, and entertaining environment that is created for the senior women to participate in what we call football, the game of life. The vision is to create a women's domestic league to inspire those involved to reach their full potential while participating in our women's league. So our mission, we are committed to administrating and promoting and developing women's football in Bermuda by creating safe, fun, and learning environments for all who participate. The plan. So right now as it stands, we have approximately between 80 to 100 senior players, so from 15 years and above, that actually play women's, that want to play women's football. So we figured the best way to do it is we're gonna create eight teams. They're gonna play nine a side. We're gonna limit the rosters to 20 players per team. And how are we gonna do that? We're gonna use the draft system where we're gonna get the players to uh, register with the association and then we'll have training sessions or um, scouting training where the coaches will come who all have to be B licensed coaches um, to come and, and select the teams, select their teams. They're going to be able to, what I'm going to say, ring fence three players from the training who they can say, I want those players in my team and assign them to their team. They're going to have to have five 15-year-old players, so five younger players. They're going to have to sign those to ensure that the young players get proper development by playing in a team and not just moving every year to a new team. The league's going to run from September through to April. 
each team will play 14 league matches. So they're going to play each other twice in a home and away basis. And we'll keep it nice and simple. We're not going to try and recreate the wheel. We're going to have three points for a win, one point for a tie. All the coaches will be able to select their own coaching staff, but they must be licensed as well. So we're going to ensure that when I said we're going to have a safe, fun, and learning environment, that the people that are actually teaching know what they're talking about. I have a question for you. You don't have to answer. Would you send your daughter or your son to school with a teacher that doesn't know the subjects? So why do we do it in football? Why do we have coaches that are not licensed? So for our program, the coaches must be licensed. Marketing. We're going to have weekly marketing campaigns um, starting in May of 2020 using all forms of social media. We also run local ads in our news agencies using the current national team players to promote the sport and encourage other females to come out and play. On set, one, of our, one of our girls, on Saturdays, we're going to visit local grooming places and supermarkets where women are. Not saying that's all you do. Yes, but we know you like to get your hair done and you like to go shopping. So we're going to set up strategic desks there so that we can put our information out and encourage women to come and be players, coaches, referees, or just supporters. Because we want to make sure that we have our own base of, of officials and our own base of spectators. So we're not relying on the other sides to, to bring ours to bring our spectators. We're going to have three levels of sponsorship packages for potential sponsors to choose from. No amount will be refused. However, we will encourage sponsors to select from our packages to ensure they get maximum coverage for their sponsorship. So for the girl package, we're going to ask for 30, 000, nothing less than 30000 and that will be the league title sponsor. They will be the league title sponsor. Some of the things we're going to encourage for them, so they're going to have a feature sponsor page on our association website, so that's some advertising for them. Corporate logos on all team uniforms. Now, this is for the league sponsor. Corporate logo field boards. They have three of those around the, the um, venue every time the matches will go on and obviously naming rights of the league. So one of, we're going to try and encourage um, female products um, to, or female stores to come and sponsor so that they have direct links to clientele. So we have some hairdressing yeah, or some uh, fashion stores. We'll encourage them to become sponsors. The silver package. It's going to be $10,000, nothing less than $10,000. They'll also have a sponsors page, um, and they'll have team naming rights. So they'll be able, we will be able to name a team after them in the league. Uh, they will have opportunity to directly, um, once a year, directly um, send a sponsorship uh, or have marketing campaigns to our players. Corporate logo board, they'll have two of those, as well as our end of season award, we'll give them eight tickets to attend the event. So they can have their, um, whoever they feel necessary to come to, to uh, the awards dinner. The bronze package will be $1,000, and they'll be considered a league sponsor. We'll give them one year advertising on our home page. You know how the ads click and they move? So they'll have one year of that on our web page. They'll have one corporate logo board at the, at the venue, and they'll have, get two tickets to our annual awards event. 
league budget. So the BFA as a count department, they'll be tasked with ensuring the league budgets are adhered to and will be are the main authority with regards to all finances. So this is just a brief budget, some of the things that, that we talked about. So uniforms, we're going to have 200 uniforms, um, eight sets of the of training gear because we have eight teams or training equipment. The coaches, we're going to pay the coaches because if we're getting them, if we want them to give us their best, we're going to make sure that they're compensated. Obviously, we need referees, and, and they aren't free. Um, and just some other, activity, uh, other budget items that you see there. So it, as you can see, our tournament or our league yearly is going to run about 64000 And If you've done the math on the sponsorship, you will recognize that we're at about 110000 So what that is, we're guaranteed guaranteeing that we're going to have at least two years of sponsorship uh, with the um, packages, the, the sponsor packages. The staffing, the women's committee, they will be assigned to different areas and responsible for um, running of the league. The committee chairperson will be the direct link between the association and the teams, and they will be the main person responsible for all communication. The league manager, responsible that all players, coaches, referees are registered, and guidelines are being followed in accordance with our league rules. The venue coordinator, they will be in charge of the field and the facilities, set up for game days, and make sure that on match days, everything runs smoothly. Competitions coordinator, we are responsible for the scheduling and assigning of referees, the final recording of all matches, and also must keep good records for end of season awards. So for the end of season awards, we're going to have obviously most goals, um, most disciplined team, and just other awards. So we're going to need to make, to, we're going to make sure that we have good records for all of that. And then the marketing agent, they'll be responsible for ensuring all promotions and operations, sorry, all promotions and the operational agreements with the league sponsors and will lead all promotion of our league. The team liaisons will be assigned to teams and referees on match days to ensure that everything runs smooth. So once you come, you have a direct link on match days. In conclusion, we believe the above will move us closer to our vision of having a fully functional senior women's league in Bermuda. We also believe with the current values of the BFA, our structure, will help us to reach our goal of increasing the number of women's football players by 50%. Each year, we will look to make the women's league bigger and better with out-of-the-box thinking to ensure the continued growth to make football the number one sport played by women and young girls in Bermuda. And just to close, um, I'd like to thank FIFA and CEI, CIES for putting on this program, because I think all of us enjoyed it. Um, the Bermuda Football Association, I would like to thank them because um, they made this opportunity possible for me to grow. Um, my office colleagues, because while I was out here, they thought I was relaxing um, for covering for me. And as well, you guys, I've learned a lot from my colleagues. Thank you. No questions? Thank you. In, in, in the first instance, it's going to be run by the uh, Women's Committee. And then for the next year, we're going to look to um, have the, our local clubs run the program.
run the team, sorry. Yeah, what we were going to allow, because we um, were hoping to get eight of the team sponsors, we were going to let the team, the sponsors name their teams first. And then if they didn't, then we will come up with the, the names for the teams. I see you said the uh, the project was related to the previous strat plan. What about with the current plan? The, the current um, strategic plan is being worked on, um, but again, for women's football, obviously we always need to grow the numbers. So I'm sure that's going to be a part. I don't want to leak anything that's not been put out yet, but the, the okay. new um, strategic plan is being worked on and will be released hopefully soon. Okay, and what about the anorganogram? All of the staff that you said, league staff, and who are they all responsible to and all of that? What was the reporting structure? They were, they were going to be responsible to the uh, committee chairperson who will be responsible to the um, Bermuda Football Association executive. Who she sits actually, the, the, the chairperson of the committee actually sits on the BFA executive council. So she would be um, directly, um, you know, we'll have a direct link. So what would be the role of the general secretary in the project? Though? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for what that. What would be the role, I'm, I'm What would be the role of? The general secretary. Just to ensure that, you know, everything's run smoothly and in accordance with the regulations of the Bermuda Football Association. Thank you. So we will now invite St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I looking for No. <laughs> Was it, where are you? Guys are there? I don't. Okay. No, this no, one's not. Right. Is she coming here? Let me see. The Bahamas, Bermuda. What? Does that have PDF? PDF Jamaica, Angola. Trinidad. 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 Oh, SDB, anyway. Nah, that's there, not there. No, it's not on the um, desktop. You put yours on the desktop as yet? Yeah, well, you could come. Come. What nah, folder? No. Do the folder there. So I call her, I call some clip here. Okay, so this is? St. Vincent and Grenadine, but they just not. There is. Yeah, my PowerPoint is not there. The PowerPoint not there. Okay. No, that's all. <laughs> Come. 
Where, come on, where, what folder it is again? up here but it's not up here Okay, um, I'm ready when you guys are. Fantastic. So um, in case you guys didn't recognize these two individuals on the screen, those are the two best presidents in the world for FIFA, right there. <laughs> um, the subject of uh, this presentation for the USVI Soccer Association is a reform in operational governance. Um, it's important to know that once you're embarking on a mission, that you know exactly what it is. So what is operational governance? Operational governance is centered on key operation, operating decisions made by executives and managers and follow through on the execution of policies. It also represents a framework for managers to improve how decisions are made and carried out. Um, the main thing, <clears throat> The main subjects in this that I wanted to point out are executives and managers following through on the execution of policies. So why did we come up with this? What, what's the point? What's the goal? Well, first, the objective is to empower the administrators along with educating them about the professionalism of football. In turn, we believe that this would have a positive effect on our administrative and our technical departments. Currently, our government, governments of operations, um, an example to give, executives will establish an authority to make decisions that officials of the general secretariat or the technical department should make. You also have instances where you have coaches think that they're in charge of the development of football in all the land and they should go ahead and tell the technical director what to do. Practices like these prove to be inefficient considering the most qualified persons hired for their respective role have limited opportunity to make their decisions. Even in instances where the decisions may seem like a good idea, even if it's a good decision, because of improper protocol, uh, you have disruption and you have miscommunication as an end result. So these practices have a direct impact on the technical and the administrative staff performance. 
Because of that, the image of USVI technical department is negatively affected and its administrative tasks are inefficiently operated. So if you see here, um, you could take a look at the technical performance, um, different categories. You have your national team wins. This is started in back in 2015 up to now. Um, just an analysis of it. Your na national team wins, your regional club representation, certified referees, licensed coaches, licensed clubs. And I know you see bars up there that says one and two and so forth, but actually you put one and it's supposed to be zero, but are you gonna put a bar diagram and you have no bars? So just to explain it right there, these, the ones are actually zeros, twos is ones, fours is threes. So we believe that um, the reason why we have inefficient performances on the field is because we have deficiencies in our organization off of the field. So what is good governance? Well, let's start with defining what governance is. I know we just came from defining what operating uh, governance operations are, but governance by itself determines clearly who has power, who makes decisions, how other players make their voices heard, and how account is rendered. All in all, it establishes authority, decision-making, and accountability. So we believe that an institutional, we will, we will have an institution of good governance implemented by creating specific regulatory policies. We think that the desired results for our good governance will strengthen and rebuild the trust of our stakeholders, members in our association, as well as the public at large and other authorities. We believe also that it would incentivize the staff to perform better. We'll be able to improve our financial performance, improve our efficiency, and establish a positive impact on legitimacy. So what does the reform process look like? Who will make the first move? Who, who is actually have to go ahead and step out and make and extend their hand first? Well, the reform process must start with the most influential people in the association. As leaders, our executives, our executive members shall accept and assume responsibility of following through on good governance practices. Like I explained in the first slide, you have to follow through on your practices and your policies. Leaders in the USVI Soccer Association shall also respect the views and the criticisms of our external stakeholders while maintaining full transparency on how we actually govern our operations. Our executive body consists of eight persons. We have, of course, your president, vice president, second vice president, assistant secretary of administration and operations, um, and other three other executive members. And this is my beautiful executive committee. We have your president, vice president, and so forth, like I explained earlier. And this is actually a very new one that just came in um, a few months ago. <clears throat> so our leaders must first hold themselves accountable to certain reform principles. Um, those involve leadership, governance, and participation. Principles of leadership um, is to affect the culture change that we want. Governance um, lays down principles of government's reform and participation, of course, fosters greater participation of club members and stakeholders. Like I explained, our desired result is to have more involvement and also have other players in the association. So an institute of good governments, what does it look like? And why are we implementing it? It's to create specific regulatory policies and this institute of good governance should have clear structures and regulatory framework, rules and regulations, strong institutions, governing bodies. You know, you have to have your checks and balances, clear tasks and responsibilities, and independence, separation of powers. Also, inclusiveness, representation of members and other various stakeholders. It must also be clear and transparent in decision-making processes. Executive leaders, like I just showed you guys before, set the tone in building a foundation of professionalism and structured operational processes. These leaders shall be educated and empowered to maintain 
a culture of good governing principles throughout the association. And this word right here, educated, how do we expect to implement good governance practices if they're not educated on how to go ahead and do that? Basic organization structure, um, our executives, as well as everyone else in our, in our governance structure, shall have decisions or shall be making decisions according to their power structure. And this is the organizational breakdown of our association, as you guys may be familiar with already. You have your Congress, our executive committee, our president, the general secretariat, and the various standing committees. <clears throat> um, if the executive body must have defined roles and functions, then they have to have a guidebook or statutes that that show them this. Statutes provide structure and order to the organization and provide a framework of roles and functions. It's important that our statutes be updated first uh, to reflect the mandates that FIFA has set and also to implement the modern intricacies of the football. It is also just as important that the key officials in an association understand the statutes clearly. So in the reform process, we plan to recreate the constitutive document uh, considering the areas that define the organization and its activities, identify good governance pr uh, provisions, define the main bodies of the association and their functions, uh, like the Congress, your executive committee, your general secretariat, your standing and ad hoc committees, and your also your independent committees. This is a copy of our statutes, and as ancient as it looks is as ancient as it is. Um, it was in 2007, we implemented it, and we haven't changed it ever since. This is why it's part of the process that we, ref um, we reform it and restructure it. The mention of committees and also policies and procedures. Well, we want to structure our standing committees that's outlined in our current uh, statutes. Like, like you guys, like any other member association, it's very busy, it's ongoing, it's ever going. So we can't stop to reform our, our statutes to, to then go ahead and try to implement certain good governance practices. So to establish control uh, the, and organization, all activities must have effective uh, management. Um, FIFA advise of, uh, of um, the, the mandatory bodies which are you know, your club licensing bodies, your player status committee, and your referee committee. And this will serve as a good start as we're setting up our committees. Once, these, um, once each committee is established, we'll create a plan along with its pertinent staff to go ahead and carry out the day-to-day -day, um, tasks as defined by the strategic goals and objectives of the executive committee. So here you have the explanation that your executive committee sets your strategic goals and your objectives, and they empower their their staff to go ahead and execute on these. Um, these individuals will not be responsible uh, for their assigned duties, or they must be uh, responsible for their assigned duties, but they must also embody the core values of good governance as well. So it's not just um, our leaders that have to be held accountable. So complement to recreating um, the statutes, we have to de develop our standing operating procedures, and po uh, which are policies and procedures for decision-making processes. Um, when, we're de when we're developing these standard operating procedures, we must look at the key operational um, areas first, like human resourcing and staffing, finances, uh, improve our mo money's, um, mechanism of money in and money out, our competitions, judicial process, club licensing, and also communications. Each of these areas must have clear and set uh, policies and procedures so everything is clear and everybody's on the same page and you have good governance. Also, especially with communications, because not everybody could just go ahead and speak on behalf of on the association and so forth. So it's, it's great, you know, it's, it would be a good thing that we have clear outlines on who can do what and how they do it. And if they don't, then they should be getting a red card for breaking the rules and regulations. <laughs> so all officials, starting with the leaders, must um, adhere to the statutes. And most importantly, the executives must understand their roles and everybody must understand the separation of powers. Um, like I explained before, 
executives shall only play at a supervisory role over the general secretariat and the committees, and the general secretariat, the technical department, and so forth. Um, must implement policies and strategies as defined and directed by the executive committee. And these are the main players in our your, your um, general secretariat. And these are the main players in the technical department. So as, as you see, it takes teamwork. And who are those two beautiful individuals there? <laughs> <laughs> So like I said, it takes teamwork. So in order for everybody to be on the same page, um, in order for there to be a good establishment of good governance, um, we, found it, we found a practical solution to that, which would be to make sure everybody gets the same training and education at the same time. The major players, um, including our Congress, members of our Congress, our executive members, our pertinent staff, like the general secretary, the technical director, head of refereeing, and so forth. And the underlying objective, like I explained, um, for this administrative course will be to empower administrators along with educating them on the professionalism of football. And we must have a system of accountability and constant assessment um, to evaluate that these changes are taking place or, or being effective. So we aim to promote an organization that's reputable for its efficiency and professionalism. So we have to be very strategic in what we do. We gotta make sure that we have a good reform plan and we have budget supporting that plan. A schedule looks something like this. It's actually real time, um, meaning that since our very first uh, course here for CIES, I actually started making moves to, to implement the plan. So this was very serendipitous that we have a presentation on the projects that we picking for associations. So here you see the, the process. April, you have your three-day workshop with the entire conglomerate that make up the core of USVI. You have your, your workshops. You have your, um, your meetings to, to reform your statutes and so forth. And this is the basic budget. The entire thing didn't auto-populate, but the budget turned out to be very affordable, total about 25,000. You guys should get the details of, this, of, of the budget. Um, all in all, this would impact the, the overall image of the association because the image of the association weighs heavily on the core competencies of the personnel invested in the organization, like our Congress members and our executive members and so forth. The core values of good governments must be clearly communicated and practiced amongst all of the internal stakeholders in the association. And this is our beautiful Caribbean island. Um, while the reform process uh, will alleviate a lot of the, the issues administratively, and f but football is ultimately played on the playing field. So the reform of our operational government process um, also suits the purpose to develop professionally apt national teams and technically stable domestic clubs, both of which will be true indicators that our project and our objective is being fulfilled. This is what we hope for the next five years. as you see the, the increase. We want more national team wins, more club representation in regional competitions, more certified referees, more licensed coaches, more licensed clubs. And I want to conclude by saying that um, I don't think it's never been a better time to be in football right now um, because we receive a lot of financial assistance, a lot of financial support, we receive a lot of educational support, receive a lot of technical support. So um, there's really no excuse right now for us to make certain moves and, and implement certain projects that we have undertaken. And just wanted to wrap that up with that. Interesting project. Any questions? What's that? <laughs> Which strategic objective does this apply to? Oh, I just picked a project um, like I was instructed. And yeah, but it had project. to tie to your strategic plan, to the organization's strategic plan. Oh, okay. So is it tied to what are the obje obje objectives? Well, 
it, it ties to every single thing in a strategic plan based on what I, I just went ahead and explained. Our good government's practices will impact our technical department and it will impact the administrative department. Uh, our technical department speaking, um, we hope that once the people that we hire to, to play the role that they're supposed to play, that they're actually empowered and not influenced by you know, our executives or people who are not supposed to be making that, those decisions. So therefore, um, it would impact our technical, um, our technical goals in our strategic plans, um, like increasing our participation in women's football or increasing our, our, um, our, youth, our youth leagues as well. Okay. Um, your presentation does not fit in the traditional rubric because um, it have marketing of different areas. But I just, um, just have been on the spot. As it relates to communication, how, how important is communicating good governance to your stakeholders? Because you're doing this, this excellent exercise, but already we have a perception of most of the MAs. So could you give me some strategies that you will do once you have completed that exercise? Well, like I stated, um, it's important that not just in the, us as individuals be educated in the good governance practices, but it's also important, I, we think that it's also important that everybody gets the education at the very same time. Hence why we put together an uh, administrative course that has members from every single one of our, um, our, our club teams in the course as well as all of our pertinent staff, as well as all of our executive members. So like you said, it's, it's important that everybody's clear and understands the good governance practices. And it's not only important that they understand it, but they understand it at the same time. So everybody's in the same room, getting the same thing at the same time, so we can go ahead and push forward. Once we figure out, once we find that all the internal stakeholders have the good education, then, then we, then we make it visible for everybody to see, um, all our external stakeholders as well. All right, thank you. So to wrap it up <laughs> and have a drum roll, we will now ask St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I bring you sleepy greetings. Good afternoon, though. Um, I'll try to be as quick as possible so that we could go to back to the hotel and rest in preparation for tonight for those of you who are going to make it. So this presentation is on the behalf of Ms. Truman and myself. I was instructed to do it. So I, to an extent, have a little choice. In last year, I think President Fraser, he initiated the female football committee and he employed a female development officer. And ever since we, we have done a number of things as it relates to female football in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We are on a drive now to actually have the first ever secondary school female competition. Actually, this Sunday coming, the male version is going to kick off tomorrow. And on Saturday, the 3rd of November, we're going to kick off the female version. This was a project that was put together by Chevron and myself, and then we passed it to the female committee who put things in place for the opening and the 2019 competition. So a number of meetings were held July, August, after we realized that we have to do a project that is not just 
for the sake of the course that we're doing, but something that's realistic. And we put together something, hopefully, we would get some additional funding by FIFA to make this possible. But a number of meetings were held with government officials and stakeholders to have the first ever female football competition in secondary schools. The initiative is to increase participation and to expand the reach of female football across St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And the Federation was committed to growing the full nine yards. So what we did is we started to have festivals in the secondary schools. And we had a number of projects we've implemented female coaches in, in 18 or 17 of the secondary schools on the island, and they are being paid so that the girls could have the basics from ball control to, to passing so we could have an actual properly put together and structured female program and national team. This assisted us greatly. We won the We for Women 2019 in St. Lucia, and this is a, a photo of one of the festivals that we had earlier up this year at one of the communities. I must apologize for this fancy thing. One of our young employees did this, so I guess. So the Football Federation female program has been training and involving 17 out of 27 secondary schools. And there is a company in St. Vincent that is responsible for transportation, air transportation, they're called One Caribbean, and they are looking to sponsor the female secondary school competition. I was told yesterday by the second vice president who is in charge of female football that another company called, that is Coca-Cola, and they heard about the initiative that we're having, and hopefully we're going to have a meeting with them next week when I get back as it relates to what they can do to, to be on board with, the, with this initiative. So the meetings that were held, these, these are the persons who were present. The technical director was there, the chair of schools football, the director of sports, the ch deputy chief education officer, and a number of supervisors from the department of sport. So this initiative is not just from the Football Federation, but we are partnering with the government. They are excited, they are on board, they have sanctioned it. They have spoken also to the principals association and the, there's another organization that is spoken to get permission for the girls to be released and stuff along that line. But the schools are informed. The registration forms are out. There is going to be a press conference. But I will get to that. A launching of the female program, I think, on the 23rd of October, which would form part of our, the Federation's 40th anniversary celebration for us as a nation celebrating independence. I said to Ms. Tremenham, because this is a lot of information, I would email all of the documents to the various associations, and I would very much like for you to go through them and to help us, give us one or two points as what we could do better, what we could do different, what we could tweak here or there. A budget is attached. I would go through it um, in a bit, but I think the total cost to have this competition is $57,000, somewhere around there. We're going to have the competition in the areas in St. Vincent and the Grenadines that is not necessarily populated with football. There's a number of areas that don't have a full-sided field, but it could take like a nine-a-side competition. So the former would take a nine-a-side and will be played mostly on weekends. And it's going to run along with the primary school football and secondary school football, the, the male aspects of the competition. So we don't complicate having the students out on a regular basis. The intention of the Federation is to get the parents and stakeholders and community involved in this aspect of the games. That's why we decided to have most of the games on the weekends. In addition to the above, the increased participation for female, part of the mission is to equip and educate the female student athletes, making them ready for the college or the professional world. Therefore, it is our intention to marry both on the field and off the field development. 
strategy. We're going to engage the business owners or the vendors in the areas, small business owners, vendors who wants to come to the game, promote their product, sell whether it's the juices or the popsicles. So we're going to have a community involvement when the games are being played. The marketing committee of the Football Federation and the government media unit will be responsible for the marketing and the promotion of the competition. Um, we're going to have a number of, well, the St. Vincent Federation presently has a show that is streamed on our Facebook page. So we're going to have a number of shows as it relates to the secondary, this version of the game. We're going to have one or two players coming in, a number of P teachers, principals doing an interview and just talking about the competitions. But these are some of the things that we're going to look at, have promotion on player profiles, play of the week, team of the week, official of the week. We're going to have fans or parents of the week by the venues and do on-spot interviews. There are going to also be merchandise giveaways, for example, tomorrow at the secondary school football launch and we're going to do a number of giveaways for our replicas and for tickets to the upcoming game against Suriname. So we want to do the same thing at the female football. As was said, communications would be done by the media unit and the federation, but all documentation would go out through the Ministry of Education. The press conference is planned for Wednesday the 23rd. That's when we would launch the competition, but it would actually kick off on Saturday, the 2nd of November. I've also attached the regulations, which I'll go to in a bit. Match day management. On game days, there's a committee that's set up that would handle the organization, the organizing of the, the, the game, let us say, at the venue. So there is a, a committee that put together everything, and there are subcommittees for the different areas. The venue supervisor would be responsible for getting the information from that game to the media unit and to the marketing department of the federation. And then both organizations would send them out to the respective media houses and the schools. Some of the information that is being requested on a, a weekly basis, challenges, what's happening at the venue, population time management. And the reason why we're doing this is that if there are hiccups in last week's game, we could fix it before the other one kicks off the other weekend. Well, that's why we're taking the information so that we could also put together the document for the stakeholders to, to, to make the next version 2020 a bigger and a better one. We understand that dealing with young ladies so that's why we're playing the games on weekend. Some parents uh, were questioning why we're having training like on afternoons and girls under the age of 16, 17 are getting home at a late time. So we realized to have fuller support and parents support and to get them in their house at a safe and an earlier time we play most of the games on the weekend. We've also had conversations with the police force and they're on board. They would be at all of the venues, not just the police force, but we've had an agreement now with a, a, a organization called the Medical Electives and they will be at all venues. We've also informed the, the General Hospital, the government, the Ministry of Health, so all of the clinics would be on alert in the event of anything. The National Sports Council is responsible for all fields and the National Lotteries, they're on board as well, they'll be given fixture, so fields would be sorted. And I said thanks. But before we finish, this is our budget, more or less. 57,000 refreshments for open and closing. They're, they're transportational costs, so we're helping the schools so that they don't have to plug out junk of the monies. This is the registration form. And the reason for it this way is so that the Federation could track the position of players in the schools, if they have a passport, yes or no, because we've realized lately that a lot of 
persons who are making the national teams don't have passport. So we've inserted this into the, regula into the registration forms so we'd be able to know who needs what. And we've had the officials management also forms for them to fill their role email address, contact number, and this document has to be signed and stamped by the PE teacher and the principal. The regulations is attached, but that's a long something, and this would run from um, October, November, and would end in December. And it is something we're going to continue to do every year. Thank you. I think, Ms. Tremenham, we should invite um, Ms. Church and probably one or two other ladies to the opening of our first ever. Jordan is right there, so he could come, but we'd send a special invitation to Malaika. I think we'd leave Miss Stacy in Zurich. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Any questions? Questions? Uh, what about the internal communication? Internal? Yes. Marketing department and the federation, once they have the information, it goes to the clubs, the affiliates, the executive, myself, comes to me and we share it out on the inside. Do you mean from in the administrative aspect or? Well, yeah, how you communicate it internally within the MA itself, but you just kind of run. Okay. What about the risk assessment? Did you do a risk assessment? You mentioned like the timing, the under 16 girls would be outside, so you are aware of some of the risk, but was there an actual risk assessment done? On the um, yes and no, but be because the Football Federation is responsible for secondary school football on the island, there are a number of things that we're doing for the males that would be easy for us to put into the female aspect of it. We've also spoken to the Ministry of Transport and they would be responsible for moving the schools with the buses on those days. So the students would get to and from the venue um, via the school bus. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So that's a wrap, folks. <laughs> so we will, um, you have any general comments? Okay. Um, so what we'll do, we'll be back here by, by 7. It's, it starts at 7, so by 6.30, so you can settle in. <laughs> and um, so I believe a, a couple of you guys are taking the maxi back. How many of us are um, using maxi to get back to the venue? All right. Yeah, it's, it's 10